Tales from the Jails with John G. Sutton. Thank you very much for uh, watching this little channel here. Hope you're going to like and subscribe, all the rest of it. And uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, the segregation unit at Wormwood Scrubs, which I have previously mentioned before. Uh, I believe that they've refurbished the scrubs now and uh, the, the seg uh, is a different place. But uh, back in the day, it was quite something. It was a jail within a jail. There were only two floors, but it was at the end of A Wing at the scrubs. So as you're going in through the gates at the scrubs, the Twin Towers, you'll see that there's a, a relief uh, images of two prison reformers. John Howard and Elizabeth Fry. That's the two figures that are in relief on, on the Twin Towers. Go through the gates of the scrubs right at the front, straight through, turn left when you get into the main body of the prison, and right to the end on the left, that's A-Wing, yeah? On the way there, on the left, you'll pass the hospital. And... Uh, a wing is the, the last wing. There's four large wings at Strange Ways, all separate, but they're joined by a corridor in the middle. But it, they're not. It's not a panopticon. It's a different design. Designed by Sir Edmund Duquesne. Around about 1858. And uh, it, the reason that they call it Wormwood Scrubs is that it was built on the scrub land that was known after the name of the plant, the shrubbery, that grow, grows on that land. And that was the wormwood. Hence, wormwood scrubs. Duquesne Road is named after the uh, the general that was commanding the, uh, the prison service at the time, Sir Edmund Duquesne. And if you were to go straight to the top, of Duquesne Road with the Wormwood Scrubs on your left followed by Hammersmith Hospital right to the top then turn left and immediate right that is where Rillington Place was now those of you familiar with the the, the, the infamous murderers of Britain will know what exactly who committed the murders on Rillington Place number 10 Rillington Place Christie he used to uh, gas them, uh, murder them, and hide the bodies about his uh, property in the walls, put them in the walls. Then he used to take them out and sexually molest them. So he, he was into, na na was it narcolepsy? Yeah, into that. Necrophilia. Not narcolepsy. Necrophilia, yeah. In other words, he was basically sticking it into dead dead bodies. So he's obviously a, a weirdo. I don't know if you've ever seen an image of uh, John Reginald Christie, but have a look online. Google him. Yeah, weird-looking bastard. Uh, and he allowed that poor, poor chap that he had as a lodger, he blamed him for the murder of one of the victims, and he got hung. <laughs> That's, that's the problem with the death sentence. Innocent people get hung. I mean, who's to say, you know? I mean, but if you bang somebody up, they're banged up for life, believe me. And my experience of working in the prisons is that uh, life behind bars is worse than death. Listen, I'm talking about the secure unit at Wormwood Scrubs. Uh, there, the staff, there was a big giant senior officer who was uh, part of the leading team of, of, of the unit there and uh, they used to have a little system whereby the, when, the, when the inmates came down for their breakfasts they used to write the name of the crime on the hard boiled eggs so Ian Brady who was on, on the segregation unit it, it was child killer yeah, that's what it was. Uh, Ron Moody and uh, all that. Ian um, Commander Commander Drury. He was on a prisoner, ex Commander Drury, right, should I say, of Scotland Yard. He was the head of the Vice Squad. He was on uh, 
the segregation unit at uh, Wormwood Scrubs, and his his hard boiled egg used to say bent copper. And they always used to pick the one the hard boiled egg up that had their crime on. If they didn't, then they used to get the tray knocked out of their hands and chased back upstairs by these extra large staff. It was a bit cruel in my opinion, but then again, I wasn't running the segregation unit. I was just uh, occasional staff on there. There was uh, various incidents on there, which I previously talked about in my book, specifically about Ian Brady getting a visitor from the House of Lords. I mean, what was all that about? His name shall forever remain a secret. I value my life, you know. I'm not going to start talking about that. Uh, and... Uh, Graham Young wasn't held on the uh, on the block. He was in the hospital unit because he was absolutely barking mad, that lad. He, if he'd have been let loose on the segregation unit or on the seg, he would have poisoned people. That's what they believe happened when he was removed from the uh, secure units of Ashworth Hospital, which was at the time called Park Lane. He was moved to Parkhurst. And he died in Parker, supposedly of a heart attack, but uh, I have it on reliable information that he was attempting to poison his fellow inmates and they decided that enough was enough. And he is no more. Yeah. Anyway, uh, as, as part of this little talk about the segregation unit, I'm going to play you a, a little excerpt from my book, which is the audio version of my book. And... Uh, this is recorded by Alan Turton, who was the uh, actor who read the audio version of this book. Yeah. And the section I'm going to uh, play you is about my evening night shift at New Year's Eve on the block at Wormwood Scrubs. 8.45pm on the Friday and I was allocated a segregation unit at the far end of A-Wing. I knew my way around the place, having experienced the dubious pleasure of meeting the nameless inmate in there some months before. It was by now fairly common knowledge that the highly dangerous prisoner who'd pissed on my boots was, in fact, Carlos the Jackal. He'd long since left the scrubs, and according to what we heard, Carlos had managed to escape from custody on arrival in France. On nights, I had no keys to open any doors, but was pleased to see the gate adjoining the young prisoners' unit and the segregation unit was open, so I could pass some time with the officer on night duty in there. Then, when I saw who the officer was, I really did smile, as I'd been at the staff training college with this man, and we knew each other quite well. Locked up in the high-security segregation unit were many seriously dangerous and infamous killers, Bombers, terrorists, sex offenders, with many serving multiple life sentences. There were also prisoners on suicide watch. That is, every 15 minutes they had to be observed to ensure that they did not kill themselves. One such prisoner was probably... Prisoner was probably the most notorious child murderer in Great Britain, and he exuded a sense of evil that I found deeply disturbing. It was my duty to look through the Judas spy hole in his cell door four times an hour and check he was still alive. This prisoner was extremely weird. He would sit on a chair directly behind his cell door, staring at the spy hole with a strange darkness all about him, like a black aura. There was a distinct chill around his cell that I could discern, and it sent shivers through me. I actually thought that this spooky character could hear my footsteps as I approached his cell. Then he would resume his malevolent glare at the back of his door. I decided to test this theory and on a number of occasions crept silently to his door and looked inside. And there he was, staring hypnotically right into my eyes. There was a mysterious connection between this murderer and myself that I never discussed with anyone at the scrubs. Many years before, my father had been an officer with the CID, a detective, and he'd been part of the team that arrested this man. 
My father attended court during his trial, and he told me some time later that the evidence the court heard was so horrendous that grown men, seasoned police officers, wept on hearing it. The week of nights passed without incident, and I enjoyed many games of Scrabble with my colleague in the YP unit. He was a former police officer from the Metropolitan Police in London, and had joined the prison service at the same time as me. He played a pretty mean game of Scrabble too. Soon, it was the 31st of December, New Year's Eve, and I was spending this in the high security segregation unit of the Scrubs. Before I left for work that night, I kissed Mary and we spent a few moments talking of our hopes and dreams for the next year, when we were to become parents. There was no doubt at all in my mind that this was to be a wonderful new year. After all, we'd waited so long for this. Mary and I shared a glass of barely alcoholic wine, drinking a toast to the future, to our new year and our new baby. It was around 11.59pm, the last few seconds of 1975, when I heard the noise commence. It was as if all the inmates on the segregation unit had started banging on their doors together, thumping, clattering, shouting, whistling, and someone had a radio on that was broadcasting the chimes of Big Ben. I was amazed at this incredible cacophony, especially as many of the inmates yelling and screaming in the new year were serving life sentences. I listened as the final bong from Big Ben struck and heard from behind one cell door the joyous shouting of a man. Happy New Year! he yelled. On the outside of his cell, the red card showed the term of imprisonment he was currently serving. It said, life times seven. That is an excerpt from my book, which you can uh, purchase on Amazon. <coughs> the audio book is, uh, is read, clatter, bang, clump. Uh, the audio book is read by Alan Turton. And I'm now going to read you a poem, seeing as I'm not going to sing. So I won't ring the song dinger today, seeing as it's fallen on the bloody floor. This is uh, Sonnet 116 by William Shakespeare. Very frequently read at weddings. And uh, it's something that I absolutely do believe in. Sonnet 116. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds. Or bends with the remover to remove. No, it is an ever-fixed mark That looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark Whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks with his bending sickle's compass come Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks But bears it out even to the edge of doom If this be error and upon me proved I never writ nor man ever loved Basically, uh, what Shakespeare's saying there is, as time passes, we all age. I didn't used to be a baldy old get with a grey beard. But I'm still married. And that, that is what Sonnet 116 is about. I sincerely hope that you've enjoyed this little Tales from the Jails. Don't forget to like, subscribe. Thank you. <laughs>